Thanks for that, Joe. Please stand if you're able to join me in the call of worship on the bulletin. Lord of all life, when we cannot see the beauty of your creation,
confessing our sins and living in the promise of new and everlasting life with you. Lead and guide us that we may not lose your way, but follow you alone. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. The word of God, the word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Dear beloved people of Christ, there's not been a time in the several decades of my ministry when I have attempted to preach with as heavy a heart as I do this morning. The Columbine, Sandy Hook, the initial terrors of the AIDS epidemic, the suffering and tragic death toll of the Ebola outbreak, out, outbreak even the night of 9-11. I have felt a sadness this week deeper than I can ever remember knowing. And into this comes these words. God so loved the world. God gave the only begotten Son to the end that all who believe in him would not perish, but he had everlasting life. In a world full of bad news, in a time when we are afraid that the way of life we know and the people we most love might literally perish from a virus that spreads as many viruses do. How does scripture speak to us this day without seeming to be just words, a platitude preachers use to try to calm and lift up all who are worried, afraid, or sad? I'd much prefer to be down there this morning as close as I can be to you, but today, my words need to be measured carefully, prayerfully offered, so that what I ask God to help me say stands a chance of not being misinterpreted or misunderstood. I have been listening carefully to the news, as I'm sure many of you have. As a frontline healthcare worker, I've been part of company-wide conference calls and additional infectious disease training, as some of you have. I've read some of the suggestions some denominations are making for altering worship. And I've received, I have received a thoughtful and prayerful request from a member here to change our passing to peace in the circle at the end of the service. I have tried every way I know how to envision leading those changes here with more love than I can say. I will respect whatever individuals in the congregation need to do to be comfortable in worship. But I cannot change my own availability in passing the peace and leading us in a circle that has been and continues to be such a hallmark of what we believe in this place. I want to assure you that I'm not naive in saying this. I need you to know some of the continual dialogue I have been having with God and myself as I look at my own situation and what risks I present myself to all of you. As a hospice chaplain, and I am in and out of a dozen skilled nursing facilities and assisted living communities in the normal course of my other work. Should I sit down as pastor because my other work potentially exposes me to a threat which then could endanger you? Do I not go into the hospital to see Guy as I did on Friday, knowing I could be at risk? How do I cope with the reality that my all my work on a good day, pre-coronavirus, could pose an immediate life-threatening risk to a family member with an extremely compromised immune system? What are the acceptable risks? And how, how do we make those decisions? Who should take them? Is there a risk of spreading the coronavirus more rapidly by the corrosive clinical effects of fear on our immune systems? How will we wise and take smart precautions without becoming so isolated we cannot help each other through this unprecedented time? I am not going to tell you how to deal with this crisis or prescribe actions for you or your family. I can only offer to you as honestly as I know how, what I am doing, and how I believe it affects me, my family, and my family at FCOA. I speak to you not only as your pastor, but as a community member, as a health care worker, as a mother, a sister, and I pray as a woman of faith. 
as I do on a daily basis, especially during flu season, I join my hospice team each day in monitoring where facilities are experiencing any type of contagious outbreak and do not go into affected buildings until, unless it is absolutely necessary. Fortunately, I have been able to avoid most communities at the height of their outbreaks this winter with those communities who are dealing with flu and a variety of other products. I do use special care with hand washing, not relying on hand sanitizers alone unless I have no other recourse than using soap and water as soon as I can. I have been in two different hospitals this week, and I've made sure to practice extreme hand hygiene wherever I've been. And like all of you, all of us, we avoid as much as possible people we know who are sick. But do we not kiss goodnight a child because they may be unknown carriers with immune systems strong enough to fight off a virus and therefore not symptomatic? or not touch an aging parent because they are at elevated risk, or not a sister parishioner who relies on this community. Where do we draw lines? How do we know what is best to do? Just as we would not push a child away or neglect an aging parent or be unavailable to a parishioner who needs us in some way, we must all do the best we can in making the best decisions possible. Years ago, so long now that many of us have forgotten, when AIDS was first discovered, it was a terror, and I mean a terror, of touching, sharing, and catching what was then a fatal disease. In some churches, the use of the common cup, as Jesus modeled for us, was changed or altogether abandoned. I remember preaching on the first annual AIDS Awareness Sunday. I made a promise to myself that day that whenever <coughs> and wherever the common cup was available, I would always drink last as a reminder to myself of the presence of God and as a reminder of being a guest at his table. It was a subtle way of driving back fear, remembering that I am a servant a way of lightening the darkness from the place of hospitality and being fed by God's hand, not my own. It is a practice I continue to this day. I am fully aware that the coronavirus is very different from AIDS. But there is one thing that is not different. The church is one of the last places, then and now, where people may be able to connect, quite literally, in a time of fear and darkness. I will continue to offer the peace as I have, and I will continue to lead us in making merciful by holding hands with whomever chooses to do that. I hope and pray that whatever any of us choose to do in worship, we will both respect and take great care not to judge another's choice. This is a time when as worried or frightened as some of us may be or become, we are all in this together. I ask you to remember the words we've heard from John this morning. Jesus, who was at risk from the time he was born, and Herod wanted him dead, to the end, for his trust and belief in God went to his death. God not only loved us then so much that God gave Jesus for us, God loves us now and knows our needs now. And not only gives us Jesus, but each other in this time and place, and gives us the love that casts out fear, sadness, which reminds us we are Christ's life now. Not all of us will be able to hold hands or feel comfortable embracing during the peace, and I understand that. But to the, to the degree that I remain healthy and believe I do not pose more of a threat to you than I have before, I will do what I believe God calls me to do, what I have always done, especially when I know some of you may not be able to. 
face like that, you know. The mind acts low when it lifts me up and refills my soul. When you are not sure which way to go, I or someone else will gently reopen at you to what you know to be true and good. We are on this road together. I ask you in both your conscious thoughts and in your prayers to imagine, truly try to imagine, a world where kindness and love and care for the other are as contagious as this virus is. What would God's world look like then? I ask your prayers for new vaccine and an end to the death toll. I ask you to share with God everything in your heart and mind and your soul. Trust you, God, to really be there. And along the way, there are some other things we actually can do. We can boost our own immune systems in several significant ways. We can reduce our long hours, seriously, and lessen our stress loads. We can spend more time with people we love, and spend time with people who bring us light and energy and avoid people who are negative or bring us down. God will take care of them too. Spend more time out in nature and connect with the myriad gifts of creation. Come back and tell us about a bluebird or a cardinal or a great blue heron that you have seen. Most of us can eat better and exercise more. We can also find and add large amounts of laughter to our life. Laughter is clinically proven to strengthen us physically. I personally recommend reruns of the Carol Burnett Show and watching or reading what really funny people who also happen to have been great humanitarians would they have said or done. People like to stand night, Danny Kay, Alan Ola, and others. We help you weather this time. And then, there is this community. However you choose to interact with this family, this community has been around for a long time and been through a great deal. Some of us have forgotten or have never known. Let us not forget how much God loves us, is there for us, is present with us, especially now. Thanks be to God. If you are able, we will stand and join the next hymn, number 361. Mm -hmm.
We pray for our servicemen and women around the world. God will bless them and keep them safe and fill their hearts with a sense of our gratitude and the knowledge that they are not alone. We pray for prayers to unite our nation, which is on our prayer list this morning, written by one of you. We pray for the leaders of the world, especially of the United States, that wisdom and courage and the will to work for the common good prevails. We pray for our elders who cannot be here or with others who have needs, for Alice Bixby, again, for all the property work that's going on, for David and Karen who are out installing a door this morning in the cold, for all the ways, for the group on Wednesday night who gathered around delicious soup made by, by Melanie, um, and for the good conversations that have begun during Lent. Any babies being expected? Any weddings coming up? May not yet be wedding season. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Ever-blessing God, you know us and you love us as we are. We ask you to look out for your world, and to make us as you call us, to be instruments of your hope, your light, your love, and your peace. It is not always easy being people of faith, Lord God, but you knew this when you baptized us into the life and death and resurrection of your Son. Bring us spring, Lord Christ, in Lent. May we know laughter, explore together. Do it now and do it together. We give you thanks for the blessing of this community and for all the ways the Spirit knits us together this day and in the days to come. We ask you to hear our prayers, O Christ, you who have given us these words to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Before we sing the Gloria Patri, I forgot to offer prayers through our World Council of Churches. Again, a worldwide fellowship of churches that seek unity and a common witness in Christian service. This week, we pray for Ireland, the United Kingdom, for England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. We pray for the many distinct cultures in these islands and how literature, music, dance, and other traditions rooted there have enriched people around the world. A prayer for uh, us offered through the cycle of prayer today, a prayer called God of Passion and Power. God of passion and power, insistent, immediate, challenging, compelling us with your story's breathless beginning. Walk us into the wilderness to hear your voice where silence reigns. Give us insight, the vision beyond all seeing, so we may look upon heavens torn open and know that the time of good news for all creation is always now. Amen. Let us now sing the Gloria Patri. seated.
Let us give thanks together. God of rebirth, kindle in us the new fire of concern and compassion for those our world leaves behind, those who look for you and need your tender, fierce presence in their lives. May we see our own need reflected through their eyes and respond with these gifts to join our sisters and brothers in seeking and finding you, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us join together in hymn number 408. The people say amen. Please be seated for announcements and many thanks again to Joe and Doug. Announcements? Yes. Uh, later on this week, uh, you will be receiving an email about the pumpkin patch. <laughs> been at the great unloading of the pumpkins last, uh, last fall, I can't in a way imagine not doing it. But it does require that we all really step up, as so many people did last year. It was, I think, a different and better experience than the year before. Um, and by that time, the website will be up and running, and we will be able to have pictures of people doing the uh, pumpkin brigade as we unloaded. That was just one of the happiest times I think we had last fall. Uh, we may not have a bride and her parents uh, there again, but I'm sure there'll be lots of other folks. So a um, couple of, of announcements. We did have a wonderful start to the Lenten uh, supper and program on Wednesday night. We do have more books and room. If you're not able to be here, but you want to follow the study, which is quite good, Please sign out a book, it's in the parlor, and take that so that you can journey if you, if you wish to. If you haven't been able to join us yet, there will be plenty of food. Come and be with us 7 o'clock Wednesday night. And I thank all the people who are cooking. 
Um, we do begin cottage meetings today with thanks uh, to uh, Alan and Vicki. They are hosting us uh, from 1 to 3.30 at their home in Millis. We actually have room for two more people. We hope a couple more people will step up and come this afternoon. Uh, there's always a danger that the groups get too big, but there also is uh, some, some downside to a group being too small. So if you can come this afternoon from 1 to 3.30, please uh, sign up in the parlor, uh, guaranteed to be a good conversation. Uh, and then the Wallaces are, are uh, hosting us next Sunday. That's what you said. Is that what you <laughs> anyway, we think the Wallaces are hosting us for dinner next Sunday night. Again, please sign up. There's room for four or five people at that one. And of course, the value of this is putting everybody's input together. I can run other cottage meetings. I've got a couple of other times if you can host. I can do one here, but it always feels different when we do it in the church versus when we're out at someone's home. So if you can do that, yeah. Yes, the cottage meetings will take five or six questions um, and run them through the whole congregation. They will involve looking at what we feel are the strengths and gifts of this congregation, you know, what are our growing edges, and what are some of our hopes for the future. So um, all the cottage meetings will be run exactly the same way. So the, co the um, questions will be asked in the same order. And I will be transcribing on newsprint everybody's response as you say it, not as I think I heard you say it. So at the end of this, we will have a, a written report that tells us what everybody in the congregation said to question one, what everybody in the congregation answered to question five or six. So it's a really good way of getting great information fairly quickly, but also having some real fun as we do it. Um, I have been running for a while, not of course here, but I have yet to find a cottage meeting that wasn't really worth the time we put into it. So I invite you to come and have some fun um, at the Mancini's this afternoon. And then if you do have fun, spread the word because we really, it would be a shame if we did only half the congregation. <laughs> and frankly, the congregation is of a size where I know that I can really offer to you in March enough groups for everybody to have participated in one. And if for some reason you're still unable to come, let me know. All right, does that help? Yeah. Uh, so there is fun, but there's also some really wonderful work that we're doing on behalf of the church as we look forward. Um, I don't remember if there's anything else I need to say. Uh, basically sign ups in the parlor. And if there's anything else, we'll send it out by uh, Linda. Uh, we will be removing the candles now that it's light enough that uh, we don't need them anymore. And I think the deacons are going to uh, have the center one at the top of the church stay lit. That's really a deacon's decision. I just recommended it might be a good thing that when anybody ever went by this church uh, at night particularly, they would know a welcome. Anything else? And there are many, 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 many people who have been part of that. Boosie, did you have something? Yeah, just we are looking for two more overnight posts. Okay. Saturday, March 28th. And okay. Okay, I hope everybody heard that. If you're on Saturday night overnight, you don't have to do all the cleanup. Some of us will be able to come in. We might not be able to stay Saturday night, but we can come in and help clean up. So Saturday night into Sunday is, if you sign up, is just staying over. Thank you very much for, I think that's all right now. Anything else? Thank you all. Why don't we stand and join in our circle and we will um, do, Actually, we are going to change the community saying, and that's going to be 431, let there be peace on earth. And we'll announce that again in a minute. Would anybody else like to do the blessing today? Does anybody else feel moved to pray? That's all right. I'll be here long enough to wait and see it happen. We will. I will. I know it's going to happen.
And, and uh, Doug is coming on over. Good enough. Yeah, don't hurry, my friend. Okay. It can be shoulder to shoulder or hand to hand, whichever you want. Yeah. We will be quiet. I think this is the blessing today.